One other concept in patient communication is the idea of shared decision making. And you know, shared decision making is a relatively new concept in India. One example is that when we, when someone comes to us with newly diagnosed uncontrolled diabetes, for example, someone comes with 300, 400 blood glucose, HbA1c 11, and the patient is then looking at immediate relief because that's human nature. We want immediate relief. So, so maybe he wants his sugars to be normal tomorrow. So what I do is actually I write down on the prescription that this is my goal for the first month and I expect your sugars to come to below 200 and I expect your A1's, HP A1C to creep down you know, by 0.5 to 1. And I think if you do that kind of thing and explain to the patient that we're going to do this stepwise, especially in chronic care, and you know, then shared decision making so patient agrees, look, this is how it is, I understand and this is how you're going to do it. I always tell them I can do it in one day, but you will get hypoglycemia or low blood sugar, and that's not required. So this actually is, is, has proved to be a great boon in communication, sharing decisions with the patient and documenting that on our prescription. But you face a more serious aspect of shared Absolutely. decision making. I'll again give you an example of an elderly person of an arrhythmia, atrial fibrillation, and as we know that more than 10% of population above the age of 65 to 70 have atrial fibrillation of paroxysmal, persistent and all that. And now we know there is a scale and a score by which we can find out the person's risk of getting a stroke, which can be minimized by giving anticoagulants, blood thinners. There's also downside to the anticoagulant, bleeding. Anything which thins the blood can produce bleeding. There's a has blood score, which tells you how much is the risk of bleeding. Unfortunately, the patients who are at the highest risk of stroke are also at the highest risk of bleeding. Now you have to explain to the patient, we are giving you a medicine, which is now previously, it used to be a medicine, blood tests every week, INRs. You're lucky you're in an era when you don't have to adjust the dose, but you have to take this medicine regularly. It is an anticoagulant. At the same time, we have to look at, we don't want you to have a stroke. There's always a chance of a bleeding. So it has to be, you know, weighed. The risk of getting a stroke, benefit of getting a stroke versus risk of getting a bleed. So the risk-benefit ratio risk benefit has ratio to be become explained. very important yes. and tell him what are the earliest signs when he can report a little blood coming in the urine or, you know, while tooth brushing, some blood coming. Just inform, don't panic, don't stop the medicine because stopping the medicine again increases the risk of stroke. So it's a shared decision. Now he has to understand that he has to take it and this is a long-term treatment because as he ages, the chance of stroke also increases. So this again is a very good example of a shared medical decision to give him a therapy. So I'll, I'll use another example, sir, which is common between your specialty and mine. So many things are common. So the, uh, the thing about statins raising blood glucose. So statins raise blood sugar slightly, maybe four or five milligrams or something. But statins are critical for protecting the heart. So sometimes patients who are informed, they say, oh, I'm not going to take a statin because my diabetes is going to get worse. You say, that's nothing. What is the main reason for treating diabetes? One of the main reasons is to protect your heart. And statins will help to protect your heart. So, so in the right patient, of course, but the fact is the patient is a candidate for a particular Absolutely. drug. We often have to explain the risk and benefit. And it's better explained than patient experiences the, an event or a risk without knowing it. I think shared decision making is a very, very important aspect of modern medicine. I think it's mandatory regardless of the kind of patient you are seeing. Unless you involve your patient yeah. in the decision, we are bound to get poor compliance, poor adherence and therefore poor outcomes. Absolutely. And you have to spend time with the patient yes. at least on one or two occasions to make him understand, to make his family understand as we were talking earlier that this is to be taken, this is very important, and this has to be taken regularly. There are no pauses in between. 
So this is very important to involve patient, physician and the family. When we talk of communication per se, what are the ways in communication that we need to avoid? So as we said, I think scaring the patient too much but yet making him aware of the seriousness of the problem is one very key factor as you outlined. Because I think that if we sort of completely scare the patient, if you do this, you're going to die, I don't think it's, it's going to work. We face this challenge with, with children with diabetes, type 1 diabetes. Now, type 1 diabetes patients, if they stop insulin, it can be fatal. Yes. We know that. So the thing is that still we avoid using words like that. Sometimes, however, one is forced in communication because people are not willing to understand the gravity. Yeah. And then you have to use, at least to the family, that look, I mean, if he gives up insulin, it can be life-threatening. Okay. So I think uh, the do's and don'ts mean that we have to work with the patient. That is a do. The don't is we don't have to scare the patient. The do is we have to try and talk in the patient's language. Yes. Now, the language doesn't necessarily mean, you know, Hindi, English, Urdu or anything. It just means talk in a language that the patient understands. Many times, you know, in informed consent and all, also these are issues because patient really has not understood what we are trying to say. So, give you an extreme example. A more common example is patient after angioplasty has to be taking aspirin and clopidogrel, say, and you don't want him to stop it. Yes. Now you have to tell him that you should not forget it because you can get into a problem. So in this day and age, a very important aspect of communication is handing over written communication to the patient. So sometimes, yes. you know, patients, when they're very anxious, when they come to us, they forget what we've told them. So giving them handouts, for example, for, for not missing their drug, giving them handouts for, for let's say, uh, what to do if you get a low blood sugar. You explain a hundred times and then when it happens, patient is still confused. But they, if they have something well illustrated that shows them that this is what I have a fallback. So, the, I mean, those are very important aspects that I have seen clearly improve outcomes. So you have to do verbal communication as well as give certain written, pictorial, uh, you know, well illustrated handouts that the patient can relate to. That's a very important aspect of communication also. And also like your patients and our patients need a very long-term follow-up. Yes, chronic care. There has to be an opportunity for the yes, patient feedback. to communicate back to yes. you. So, so, you know, if it's a disease like diabetes or hypertension, now you see your doctor once in three months, sometimes once in six months. If you're not well, then maybe monthly. But the, the condition is there with you 24 by 7, 365 days. So it is you who has to deal with it. So we have to empower our patients to deal with these problems because we cannot be living with them all the time, Absolutely. right? And therefore, all this communication becomes doubly important and access, and of course, with modern digital uh, avenues now, the access to doctors has become easier. The pandemic has helped us open yes. out a little bit in terms of communication. So all this has become part of communication rather than just talking to the patient. And the outcomes of the patient and the disease are much better when it is supervised. If you leave it to the patient, take it for a year. But if there is a Some patients mechanism. in clinical trials do much better than the patients worldwide. Who are worldwide. worldwide. Yes. worldwide. Yes. Because you're supervising them. Your coordinator is calling. Are you taking ABC? So some kind of a check yes. on the supervision, which is not too much of a burden on the physician. At the same time, don't give the liberty to the patient to call you up every evening yes. uh, what I'm doing. So, compromise on that, yeah. but outlooks certainly are important if the treatment is supervised. So we've been talking a lot about the importance of medication, not missing medication, but a larger concept of secondary prevention or even primary prevention oh, yes. for that matter is based on lifestyle. And again, communication about lifestyle is even harder and more important for the long-term outcomes of the patient. So if you're looking at reducing heart disease, if you are looking at reducing eye disease, if you are looking at saving kidneys, lifestyle plays a key role and good communication about lifestyle has a direct impact on outcomes in addition to the medication we talked about. And 
we have to spend time with them for dinner and then take their feedback, is it okay? We've discussed about communication and I think one aspect that deserves attention is the fact that patients can see a lot in our body language and how we communicate. So it's not just the spoken word, it's also our expression of surprise or disappointment or, or concern that influences patients a lot. So I guess real good communicators would use both verbal and, and sure. non-verbal, anything that works with that particular patient. How, how Absolutely, you, you know, there are some people, you may go on giving them sermons. Yes. It doesn't register to them, not that they're not understanding your language, but what works with them is visuals. Show them the vision in a different way. And as you rightly said that, you know, your expression, yes. your disappointment at his non-compliance, your sort of anger in your face, or your happiness and, you know, feeling a pleasant sensation that, see how good you're looking today. Uh, you're doing so well, it's written on your face, I can see it. So that small, subtle things go a long way in managing the patient. To, our ultimate aim is to have better outcomes. Better outcomes, absolutely, sir. You know, sometimes you don't realize the importance uh, uh, of our small gestures and how closely the patient may be observing us. And I think that that communication part is really important. And as you very rightly said, sir, I completely agree, can have a great bearing or a connect with the patient. Yes. How well they will follow the treatment and ultimately, obviously, on the outcome. Goal is the same. So you will agree, Dr. Call, uh, this was a very different experience. It was great fun talking about communication. I'm sure the viewers enjoyed it, especially in this unique place, the Museum of Illusions, and using various aspects to highlight importance of patient communication out of office. Absolutely. And stay tuned for the next episode of Out of Office. <music>